Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Many people, when they hear the concept of a great flood that destroyed all the animals and all the people that were not in the ark, they laugh at this. They do not think that such an event took place. And there's a reason for that. Our enemy, Hasatan, Satan, does not want us to think that there is a God who will punish severely those who do not respond to his instruction. No, the Bible is very clear. All that were not with Noah in the ark, they perished. Now, what we're going to do in this seventh chapter of Genesis is that we're going to learn very important principles that all human life needs to understand. And it's only when we respond obediently to this are we going to find the future that God has for us. If we reject this wisdom, well, we are going to find God's judgment, his displeasure. And when we look at chapter 7, we're going to see that this chapter leaves no doubt whatsoever that our God is a vengeful God. Yes, he is gracious and merciful and forgiving, but there is a location that we find those things, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness. And if we're not in that location, which only the word of God will bring us there, then what can we expect? Utter devastation, utter destruction. God's wrath is real. And when we discount that, well, we're playing into the hands of our enemy. We're hearing and doing what he wants us to do. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Genesis and chapter 7. Now, we left off with a revelation from God. He spoke to a man called Noah or Noah, a man that was unique in his generation. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And God spoke to him. He revealed to him what he was supposed to do. And Noah became a symbol of salvation. It was only through what Noah provided from God's instructions, obviously, that there would be life. Without that which God provided through his shaliach, that is the one whom he sent, without that, the outcome would be death. So look with me to verse 1. Chapter 7, the book of Genesis and verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Noah, You come and all your household to the ark. Now, God is very specific. There is only one place to avoid God's judgment. It's not a multiplicity of locations, but only one. And the only way that one can find that location where they can find deliverance and, and the ability to overcome God's judgment is if we respond to his instruction and get to that one location. Now, right here, many theologians have a problem because they want us to believe that there are many ways and many paths that you can take for salvation that there is many different religions, and each of these religions, if we follow it, it's a different way, but all roads lead to the same location, and that is heaven. Well, that is blasphemous because it is a front to God's provision. God provided only one way for us to overcome his judgment. Now, it's obvious 
that people were guilty. They did what was evil in the eyes of God, and they were doing that continuously. But nevertheless, because God is merciful, because he is gracious, because God is forgiving, God reveals one means through one proclamation. And in that age, Noah was the one who received it, he proclaimed it, and he provided the means for deliverance. So look again. The Lord spoke to Noah, and he gave a commandment. He says, you come and all your household to the ark, for you I have seen righteous. Now, the emphasis here is that God has beheld Noah and saw him. Notice what it says. You I have seen righteous before me in this generation. There was something unique about Noah. And the word here is righteous. Now, the term righteous in this passage is sadiq. And what's unique about it is that it relates to a, a grammatical construction that has to do with being made righteous. Now, what do we see throughout this account of Noah? We find that he was someone who responded to God. And when we respond to God and we move in according to his word, his revelation, God is going to bring about through his power, his provision, righteousness in our life. So Noah had a tendency, not like all the others in his generation, to respond to God. And we see that where? Well, we see that in the fact that Noah dedicated his life to building an ark. We see at the end of uh, chapter 5 that when Noah is mentioned, he's 500 years old. But at the time of the flood, he's 600. Now, some would say that approximately 120 years have passed, but when we look at the scripture, we see 100. And whether we're talking about 10 or 100 or 1,000, that concept of 10, 100,000, whatever it may be, multiples of 10, 10 relates to wholeness or complete, a complete or totality. So Noah here, he heard God's revelation. He responded in a, a complete manner. His whole life, his life in its entirety was based upon God's instruction. And therefore, that is why we see this affirmation of righteousness. The outcome of God's revelation when it's applied to our life is righteousness. So Noah was demonstrating that differently than anyone else in his generation. Move on to verse 2. Now, we see something else that's very significant. If you look at verse 2, it says, from all the behima, the word behima, is not the word animals, but it's a unique word. It usually speaks of animals such as cattle and sheep and goat. Oftentimes today in modern Hebrew, we would say that for uh, domesticated animals. Animals, when they see human beings, they're not alarmed. They do not attack. And so he says here, from all the behima for every domesticated animal which is and it uses word behima tohora now that is the word for pure perhaps in your bible and there's nothing wrong with this it talks about those who are clean so we're speaking about animals in a general sense which could be used for sacrificial purposes in other words they are related to the purpose of god in some way it's not clear here, but most scholars believe that we're talking about sacrificial animals. So once again, verse 2. From every clean animal, that is those domesticated type, you shall take seven. Now, why seven? Well, seven has to do with holiness. It has to do with the purpose of God. So this simply supports the idea that these uh, behemoth, Tehorot, 
these clean, domesticated animals, they are related to the purpose of God. And it says seven, and then it gets very interesting. It says, ish ve ishto. Now, if we would translate this generally, in any other place that it would appear there, it would say, man and his wife. Now, this is of great significance. It's unique that we speak about animals in this term, a man and his wife. But what this is saying is this. We can see an affirmation of this type of, of unity. Male and female, that's what we're going to see in the middle in a moment, but it's going to relate to this union, a man and his wife. So we're talking about seven pairs, we'll see this in a moment, seven pairs of animals which are male and female, but there's a unique relationship between each male with a particular female. So what is this upholding to us? Well, it's upholding to us the concept of marriage, that there is one man and one woman. That's what God is, is exemplifying here. So look again, verse, verse 2, and you shall take seven, seven men and seven spouses, we could say, from these behemoth, from these uh, uh, domesticated animals. And it says, and from the animals which are not pure or not clean, he says, you should take two. And what does it mean two? We can take two males or two females? No. It says again, ishve ishto, that you should take those that are what? Together as in a marriage. And what most scholars see here, see here is that we're talking about those types of animals that are mating with one another, that there's a relationship, that in the end, after the flood is over, that these two are going to produce offspring. So we have a marital relationship, even though we're talking about animals. And what is the connection? This, this mating for offspring. Now, verse 3. Also, from the fowl of the heavens, you shall take seven. And here it speaks differently. When we speak about these fowls or birds, it says take seven of them. And then it says male and female. For what purpose? Well, for the purpose to, to make life that there should be a seed. And seed is also understood as offspring. For the seed to survive upon the face of all the earth now there's a very very important concept we see here even though god's judgment is falling it is in the end for the purpose that the life would continue in a different way god's judgment is for the purpose of change we can say it in a different fashion for believers now god does not judge us for the purpose of destruction, destroying, for the purpose of, of wiping us from his sight. No, if we are a follower, God will discipline us. But whether we're talking about judgment or discipline, there's something that it has in common. And that is that it brings about a change. A change that relates to a future so this devastation which is coming through the flood is not to end life, but it's to produce life, but to bring about a change. God doesn't want that continuously evil being the description of, of this next generation, this generation after the flood. Once more, verse, verse 3, and also from the fowl of the heavens, seven, seven males and seven females and what's the purpose in order to to keep alive the offspring upon the face of the earth verse four for in seven days i am bringing rain it's the word mamtir now this word 
is a word from rain, so we could say make it to rain or cause it to rain upon all the earth. Now, why does God say in seven days? Well, there's a repetition of that number seven. Seven is related to holiness. Holiness is related to the purpose of God. So this passage of scripture yells out loudly that there's a purpose for this, that this is not happening without any regard to something but there's a clear reason why god is doing this so he says to noah and this is very very vital he reveals that in seven days that the floodwaters are going to begin he's going to cause it to rain so noah had a warning not just a general one that judgment is coming but when it's going to come. And we can look at that and realize that there's going to be signs in the last days of God's wrath coming. God's going to reveal to those that he knows in a covenant relationship the, the closeness of God's judgment falling. Why? So that we can respond appropriately, respond in obedience. Verse 4 once more. For in seven more days, I am causing it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now, the number 40 is going to repeat uh, frequently in this account. We've talked about several times that the number 40 reveals a transition or a change. So if we didn't understand the purpose of this was for a change, well, we do now with the fact that 40 is mentioned and there's something else that we can see about this number 40 not just a a transition and change but but whenever we see the number 40 we also see a change for the will of god when 40 happens when that word or number appears in the text it's to bring about a transition towards the will of god the purposes of god and that's exactly what we see in this passage. He says, in 40 days and 40 nights, I'm going to cause it, or for 40 days and 40 nights, I'm going to cause it to rain upon all the earth. And he says, here's the outcome. Still in verse 4, and I will wipe away. Now, this is a strong word. I will wipe away all the hayakum. Now, usually, when we come across that word hayakum, we're speaking about the entire creation. We're speaking about not just one galaxy, but all the galaxies, the entire universe, we could say. And what is he doing? Well, he is judging, bringing his devastation upon earth. And that is very significant because he uses the word here, hayakum, which means all the cosmos, we could say, all the, the, the universe creation that is out there, not just in this galaxy, but in all the galaxies. And what can we derive from that? Well, if God destroys earth and he uses this word, you know what it tells us? It tells us there's no aliens. There's no uh, life in other places. We don't, we don't see that. When God destroys life on earth, it destroys everything. Now, of course, the only exception is, is heaven. But heaven transcends the yukum. It's outside of the universe. So God chooses words here of great significance. I will wipe away all the universe which I have created upon the face of the ground. Verse 5. And Noah, he did, and this is emphasized here, it's emphatic. And Noah, he did according to all which the Lord commanded him. Now, this is unique because normally it says what he had said to him. But here we find that word for command. The same root as we get the phrase commandment, mitzvah. This is simply the verbal form. And it's only when we respond to the instructions, the commands of God, are we going to be 
found faithful. Now, this is not a salvation passage here. This is an obedient passage. What God is doing here is that he's bringing devastation for a purpose so that in the end, in this transition, this change that's coming, that his will will be manifested. That's what he's wanting to do. Now, let me pause and say this is not going to be successful because when we get into to chapter 10, we're going to see that God is very displeased once more with the world. And what we're going to be learning here, and I've spoken of this in another uh, teaching, and that is kind of the, the Noah experiment. Now, it's not for God, it's for us. Noah is the most righteous in his generation. It doesn't mean that he is perfectly righteous. God has simply said that he saw Noah to be righteous in his generation, that he, more than anyone else, exemplified what God was looking for. doesn't say he was perfect. Now, what can we conclude from that? Well, here's the, the Noah experiment. If you take the very best individual, the one who more than anyone else wants to hear and respond in obedience to God, and you build a new race through him, well, in the end, you're not going to have anything different. See, the Noahite experiment was a failure. But, but when we leave Noah, who do we come to? Avraham. And Avraham is known not simply for what he's done, his willingness to hear God, but there's a very important word that is connected with Abraham. And that is faith or belief. It was only because Avraham believed in God that there was hope. Here we're going to see that Noah being a righteous one in his generation is not going to bring about the desired change and the right transition that God wants. Now, this didn't surprise God. It was not a shock to him. He knew it. This is being recorded in order to teach us that our righteousness, the very best human, humanity has to offer, in the end, is not going to be pleasing to God. Well, let's continue. Look now to verse, verse 6. And Noah was 600 years old, and the flood was water upon the earth. Now, what does he say here? is that when Noah was 600 years old, and this is significant, it is when the waters came. So it was not when he was 601 or 620, but it was exactly when he was 600 that the flood waters came. And Noah here is an image of, of safety, of deliverance. Now, what can we glean from that? Well, once again, numbers are important. 600, whether we're talking about 6 or 60 or 600 or 6,000, when the number 6 appears, we're finding that it relates to God's grace. So Noah, when the floodwaters came, what did we glean? Noah was a symbol of grace. How's that? Through Noah's proclamation, we know in the New Covenant, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And what did he want to tell people? If you respond to the provision of God. Now, Noah built it, but he built it through the instructions of God, through the revelations of God. So when we respond to what the word of God provides us, well, we're going to find deliverance. And all of this comes, and this is what this verse is trying to teach us, verse 6, it all comes within a packaging of grace. So look again, verse 6. And Noah was 600 years old, and the, the flood, and it's defining it, was water upon the earth. Verse 7. And Noah came, and his sons, and his wife, and the wives of his son with him. 
And once again, we always have to ask, where's the emphatic part of a verse? What's being emphasized? And here in this case, it is with him. Now, this concept of with is related to redemption. Now, redemption is, very simply, when God moves, he purchases something in order for us to belong to him. And so here, what we find is that Noah, he was used by God. God was, was possessing his life. Noah did what God said, him, said for him to do. And in this, we find an image of, of reconciliation. Through God's grace, through his instruction, through his provision, those who were with Noah found life. They did not find the devastation. So, verse 7 once more. His family entered into the ark with him. And we see from before the waters of the flood. Now, they had a choice. This is so important that we see how these simple principles are being revealed in this passage of Scripture. God gave choice. You could either choose the floodwaters, that is, to be destroyed, or you could choose to be with Noah. No other place in between. Those were the only choices that were offered. Either choose the waters of destruction or Noah. And what we need to realize, and this passage as well teaches us much about the gospel. We can either choose to be with Yeshua, or we can choose the water is not going to be our source of destruction, but rather it's going to be fire, eternal consuming fire that never ends and never ceases. So that's what God is offering. Either be with Yeshua, or be in his judgment, his eternal wrath. No position other than those two. Now, when we discount the, the reality of the flood, and we say, oh, that's just a fairy tale, that's just some story, well, when we don't believe it, you know what's going to happen? Internally, we won't believe that there's really the wrath of God. And today... It is very, very popular to believe in the love of God and deny the wrath of God. That is going to fill stadiums. People want to hear, I'm just going to receive God's love. And if I'm not obedient, if I don't respond to his invitation to, to accept his son, if I don't do what I should, if I don't respond as I should, if I don't really believe as I should, I just go my way. In the end, I'm still going to get God's love because he's always forgiving. He's always gracious. Well, that is a lie from Satan. We see here that God is not always gracious, that God always forgives. Quite the contrary. The flood speaks about that in the end, there is going to be a clear, bold manifestation of God's wrath upon this world and it's only those who do not belong to the world but belong to the kingdom the kingdom of his son now the rabbis point out that there's a connection between that ark a place of God's deliverance and the kingdom so all of this is kind of a paradigm an example for us to understand the choice that God offers to us. So look now at verse 8. From the clean domesticated animals, and from the animals which are not clean, and from the fowl, and from everything that creeps upon the earth, what do we see? Two by two they came to Noah. Now they just didn't come to the ark. But they came to Noah. They recognized God's selection, God's choice of this man. Now here again, this is the paradigm for us. God chose Yeshua. 
his only begotten son to be the source of revelation, that gospel message that he spoke for three years, and also to be his life that was offered up upon that tree that received God's judgment. His life was the source of provision for God's grace. So in the same way, we're going to see in the movement how this ark that Noah built, how it is in God's wrath, but it did not bring about destruction, meaning the ark was not destroyed by it. And in the same way, the resurrection speaks of overcoming the judgment of God. So these animals, they respond to Noah. And they came to the ark, both male and female, and here it is, just as God commanded with Noah. So the point I want you to see here is that these animals are responding in obedience, just like Noah did. They heard, they recognized, and they responded. Now, this is to show God's sovereignty over all things. Now, do we glean from this that everything that happens, God makes? No. But we see an example here of God's order being fulfilled. He called, and there was a response. And what we should learn from that is this. God is calling you. He's speaking to you. Flee from his wrath. Go to the one whom he's provided so that you can be delivered, that you can experience a future, a future that God wants for you, that God has provided for you. We're going to see that message repeated over and over, not just in the account of Genesis and the flood, but throughout the book of Genesis and the other things that we're going to study together. Look now to verse 10. It says here, And it came about in seven days that the flood waters that they were upon the earth, and this took place, verse 11, in the 600th year of the life of Noah. Very important. That number six, whether it's 600 or six, is being emphasized. And it also happened, look at this, it did in the second month and on the 17th day of the month. Now, what do we know about this? Well, the second month, the number two speaks about uh, two different, I like the word divergent, opinions or thoughts or perspectives. And we see that it was very providential that God's judgment fell on the second month. It's emphasizing the problem. See, God wants there to be unity. When we look, for example, in the book of Zechariah chapter 14, where we have a description of God's kingdom. You know what number appears there? Echad, one. And Echad, one, speaks about unity. And, and God wants us to respond in obedience to him. And when we do, there's unity with him. But because of these two different perspectives, and we find Noah, he went with God's perspective, and the rest of the world, well, they went with the world's perspective. And we know the outcome from it. It says, on the 17th day of that month. Now, the number 10 speaks of, we've already talked about it, that which is complete or whole or that in its entirety. And the number 7 speaks about holiness or the purpose of God. So this floodwaters, they came on the 17th day of the second month to speak about judgment for that other perspective. But nevertheless, the 17th day, what we should glean from that is there was a clear, complete reason or purpose for this floodwater. God did it for a reason. And that's what the number 17 speaks of. And on that day, the month of, we would say today, E-R, 
the 17th day of the month of Iyar, what do we know? Look carefully in the middle of verse 16. It says, And all the springs that were in the great depths. Now, the word here, to home, can be abyss. So we're talking about very, very deep springs. It says they were split. And also the arubot, that is usually the word chimney, the chimney of heavens, and it's in the plural, they were also open up. And what happened? Water came from above and water came from below. Both of those things happened. So we see it from two sources, from above and from below. Verse, verse 12. And it came about, and we use a different word. Earlier, when we talked about God causing rain, it was a word, mamtir. But here it's the word Geshem. And it came about Geshem or rain upon the earth once more. Forty days and forty nights. This, this flood water, this, this Geshem was going to bring about a change. The water was a source of transition that God wanted to make upon this earth. Verse 13. And Be'etzim Hayom Hazeh, which means we would translate it perhaps on that very day that Noah came and Shem and Ham and Yephet, the sons of Noah and the wife of Noah and the three wives of his sons. On that very day that they came with Noah, it says here, to the flood. Exactly. They came in. God will see, close the door and the flood waters began. Now, perhaps, perhaps, when people saw, they go in. Now, remember, this is in a desert. This is not the place for, from the people's perspective, God's judgment to fall. Now, just think, most people think, well, you know, the reason why they deny God's judgment is because they don't think they're really so bad to be the recipient of, of His wrath. They look at this world and they say like Anne Frank did. Now, now we can, can marvel with, with her and the many people that suffered, those who endured and those who did not. But nevertheless, they endured that Holocaust. And we can look at them in, in a perspective. First of all, grieving for them, but also some of them, what they went through. And that they survived it. What a testimony of just the perseverance. But Anne Frank said, you know, still, I believe that, that people are really good. Well, let me tell you, they're not. What God says is that really, deep down, without God's influence in our life, and ultimately bringing that change in our life, we are evil. Meaning that we are going to be the recipients of God's wrath. And the people... Perhaps when they saw exactly when they went in, that's Noah, his three sons, and those four women, eight people in together, when they went in and the rain immediately began to flaw, fall. And they found it coming not just from below or up above, but also from below. They might have been changed. They might have wanted to get in that ark. But you know what? There is a time when it's too late. Why do I say that? Well, look on to verse 14. And they, now we're speaking about what's inside the ark. It says, they and all the animal, every animal according to its kind, its species, and every domesticated animal according to its species, and everything that creeps upon the earth according to its kind, and every fowl according to its kind, and every winged bird according to its kind, it says here, they came to Noah, to the ark, two by two, from all flesh, which was in it the spirit of life. So what we find is God's provision in the sense that God provided what was necessary to sustain life, every aspect of it. He was going to sustain a remnant, and that's going to become very important. Not all, but 
a remnant survived. That remnant that what? Listen to God's revelation. Look now to verse 16. And they came, male and female, from all flesh they came, just as God commanded him. And the Lord closed up, meaning closed up the ark for him. Now, that's important because, you know, perhaps if, if Noah would have been the one that closed the ark, sealed it, well, people could have broken in. Perhaps those floodwaters would have been too devastating for, for Noah's workmanship in, in closing up that door. But the point is this. The entrance, the people went in through, and God sealed it. And the, the emphasis here is nothing could get in and nothing could get out. God closed that, that way, and there's a time coming when the way to enter into the kingdom of God will be over. In a general sense, when God initiates that kingdom, but also for a personal sense, when there's no longer life in you. When you die, it's too late. You may have a change of thought just like that rich man in the account of the book of Lazarus from the rich man and Lazarus. That, that man changed when he was experienced that torment in Hades, but it was too late. And that's what the end of verse 16 speaks with. God closes the door and no one else is getting in. Verse 17. And it came about the flood for 40 days upon the earth and the waters were mighty or abundant. And it lifted up the ark. And it lifted it above the earth. So we see here that there is an upwardness. What we see here is that there was an overcoming. God lifted the ark above the waters, above the judgment. And that's important, this, this going up and overcoming God's judgment. Now, I believe that that is an example of our blessed hope, the rapture, that God's going to take us up. And by this being lifted up, we're going to find that we overcome the wrath of God. But it gets better than this. Look, if you would, to verse 18. And the waters, they were mighty. It's a verb form. The waters, they were mighty, and they were greatly abundant upon the earth but the ark went upon the face of the waters verse verse 19 and the waters that were mighty it says meod meod they were very very mighty now what this is speaking to is that there was a supernatural aspect to this water it wasn't simply a natural event it was supernatural and that's why people have such a hard time. If you only look to science for your explanations, see, God transcends time, He transcends this world, and He also transcends science. You know what we call something that transcends science? A miracle. And so it's simply saying here, in this judgment falling, God manifested His, His transcendent character that he transcends all things so once more verse 19 and the waters were very very mighty upon the face of the earth and they covered every high mountain now this is important because mountain is synonymous with government mountain also was a place of pagan worship so God is destroying, he's overcoming every human authority and every false God of mankind. Look again, verse 19, the waters were very, very mighty over the earth and they covered every high mountain which was underneath the heavens. And it says, by 15 cubics above, now, why is that important? Well, the number 15, when we look at it biblically, it's yud Hey. Why is that important? Well, if you write those two letters, Yud being 10, 
Hey being five today, we write nine and six. Why do we write tet vav instead of yud hey? Because yud hey is yeah, it relates to God. So here we see that, that by 15 cubics, it was over. So it refers to God, that God overcome what we're speaking about here. For the waters were mighty and they covered the, the mountains, but God's presence was over that. He transcends that. Verse 21. And because of that, we find, and all flesh, everything that creeps upon the earth, the birds or the fowl, the, the domesticated animals and other animals, and everything that teemed, everything that teems upon the earth, and every man, it says, they expired, they died, they gave out. So we see a connection between God's judgment and death. Now, notice, it is very hard for many people to accept that the God that they have come to believe in, this uh, always good, always kind, always forgiving, this one that is always gracious, that he would destroy all human life and all animal life except for what was on the ark. And it's a very clear principle. Only those who are kingdom people, those who have responded to God's invitation through the gospel, only those are going to be safe. And when we look at all of humanity down through the ages, generation after generation, those who are going to be in the kingdom, well, just like those that were in the ark, it's going to be a very small remnant. Now, in the end, that small remnant, God's going to make great, but we have to get the paradigm. And that is, what does Yeshua say? The way that leads to eternal destruction is broad and easy, but the one that leads to eternal life is very narrow and difficult. Few shall find it. That's what this testimony is, is all about. Now look at verse 22. And all which had the breath of life, uh, the spirit of life, the breath of the spirit of life in its nostrils, and all which was on the, the land, and it uses the word here, harava, the, the dry land, we say today, uh, uh, a term just, just all upon the physical earth, they died. Verse 23. For he wiped away everything in, and he uses his frames, Hayakum, the universe, which were upon the face of the ground, from man until animal, that which creeps the birds of the heavens. All of this, it says, he wiped from the earth, and look at the end, and remain only Noah, and which was with him, those that were with him, with him in the ark. So there was a remnant of simply eight individuals and those animals that responded to the commandments of God and entered into the ark. Now, here again, is this saying, oh, by the commandments of God we're saved? No, but, but there is a very important commandment. And that is to believe in the gospel. Believe in what God has provided his only begotten son, Yeshua. And the ark, remember, it was in the 600 year that the ark was completed, the 600 year of Noah's life. So there's a connection between the ark and grace. What Noah proclaimed was a message of grace. So look again at verse, verse 23 at the end. And all was white, all these animals and every person that was not in the ark, they were white from the face of the earth and only remained Noah and, and that which was with him in the ark. Verse 24. And the waters, they were mighty upon the earth and they were so for 150 days. 
Now, the reason why 150, what's 150? 10 times 15. We see an emphasis here in that number, 1515. What do we learn about that? The number 15 relates to God. So this mightiness of the waters, what does the waters refer to? The source of God's judgment, his wrath. And this passage ends in a very clear way, in a very strong way, saying all of this came about because of Yah. The number 15 is related to Yah, that sacred name of God, the abridged form of it. Not yud Hey vav Hey, but simply the first and the last letter of that name, Yah, God. So God brought about this wrath. That's what it's trying to say. This vast devastation, these mighty waters that represented the power of God, and water is heavy. I mean, water is massive. And what God is saying is that his massive, heavy judgment, his wrath fell, and he was the cause of this all because of the wickedness of man. God will massively, mightily put his judgment upon that which is evil. And unless we understand that, we're never going to seriously take and listen to his proclamation, his word, his revelation of a way to escape this wrath. Now, the point that's really important, and I'll close with this, is that does it say anything about the righteousness of Noah's sons and their wives? It does not. What's emphasized here is that they were saved because they responded to God's provision. And it's only when you and I respond to God's provision of Messiah Yeshua. It's only then, doesn't matter what we have done, how evil we may have been or are, but when we respond to that gracious message by faith, not of works, but it's a free gift, when we respond to that, we will be brought and led into the kingdom of God, and there we will be with him for eternity. Well, we see the message of Yeshua, not just in the New Testament, but we see it in many places throughout the Old Testament. Because the key message of the Old Testament is also the key message of the New Testament. And that is, there is a gracious God that saves. Well, I'll close with that until next week. And we continue on in our study of the book of Genesis. And we'll begin chapter 8. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.